Hey guys, it's Libby and welcome to my November Bard Book Club video. Today I will be talking about All's Well That Ends Well. Now, last month in my wrap-up I mentioned that I had read Julius Caesar, um, not for the Bard Book Club, but just for fun. Um, and I think that may have subconsciously been because I sort of link Julius Caesar and All's Well That Ends Well, uh, but not because of any particular similarities in their content or style, because um, they don't really have many similarities in their content or style. Um, well, they do have several scenes set during a war, but so do many of Shakespeare's plays. Um, but because they are kind of the opposite of each other in my own personal experience of Shakespeare, uh, and that is that I think um, Julius Caesar is the best of Shakespeare's plays that I read least often, and All's Well That Ends Well is the worst of Shakespeare's plays that I read most often. I read them disproportionately to how good they are. So I will freely admit, All's Well That Ends Well is not like a super great play. It's weird, stuff does not always make sense, but I just like it, what can I say? But even though I've read this so many times, I found that reading it knowing that I was going to have to make a video talking about it made me like see all sorts of new things in it. Um, and I, I th <laughs> this video series is teaching me that each of these plays really needs their own sort of video about them. Um, so I will not be presenting like this is my grand unified theory of All's Well That Ends Well, uh, nor will I be, um, you know, having deep discussions about each of the characters or anything like that. Um, in this play, I am going to invite you into the experience of what it was like for me to read this play. I put an unusually high number of sticky notes in this play um, compared to the other ones I've read for Bar the Bard Book Club. Um, so I'm just gonna go through the play and, uh, you know, tell you what I was thinking as I was reading it, uh, which I think might be helpful for people who are sort of just getting into Shakespeare and want to know what sorts of things people who've read lots of Shakespeare think about when they read. Shakespeare. Have I said Shakespeare enough? And uh, presumably in doing so we will discuss some of the themes of this play, as well as um, in some way address the question of what genre this is, which has been a bit of a puzzle for many people. But I'll just go ahead and spoil my secret right now regarding what genre I think this should be categorized as. I think this should be categorized as a proto-romance. Um, it is the only of Shakespeare's plays that I would categorize as a proto-romance, but hopefully I can convince you that the, that is the best place for it uh, during the course of this video. So let's start by looking at the first seven or so lines which are delivered by the Countess Bertram and Lord Lafeu. The Countess says, In delivering my son from me I bury a second husband. Bertram says, And I, in going, madam, weep o'er my father's death anew, but I must attend his majesty's commands to whom I am now in ward evermore in subjection. And Lefeu joins in with, You shall find of the king a husband, madam, you, sir, a father. And the first thing that I notice here, which will become a rather frequent occurrence in the vocabulary of the play, as well as in the plot of the play, is this notion of like the interchangeability of family members. Um, the Countess is comparing Bertram to her husband. Lefeu says that in the king, the Countess will find a husband and Bertram will find a father. Uh, obviously, she's not saying that the Countess is actually going to marry the king, um, but that the king will sort of fulfill the role of husband. Um, so we're going to see lots of people fulfilling the role of, that is meant to be filled by some other member of their family. And we also um, get the first inkling of Bertram's character when he says, And I, in going, madam, weep o'er my father's death anew, but I must attend his majesty's command. Um, I don't think this is meant to be read as Bertram actually being about to weep over his father's death anew. Um, he doesn't actually care about his dad's death because he immediately says, gotta go hang out with the king. Um, and this makes Bertram actually similar to Helena, whose father has also recently died, um, and she has recently become a ward to somebody else. The Countess has become her mother in the way that the King of France has become Bertram's father. Um, 
Uh, and neither of them are actually sad about their dad. Helena appears to be sad about her dad, but is in fact sad about Bertram leaving. So let's move on to a little bit later in the scene when Helen first speaks to us in a uh, sequence that is very reminiscent of another play Shakespeare was writing around the same time, Hamlet. And since he was writing um, both of these plays around the same time, that means he's also writing them uh, recently um, after his son's death. Um, his son was named Hamnet no connection to Hamlet, presumably because um, Shakespeare used the name Hamlet from the uh, original source that he based Hamlet on. Um, so the Countess uh, tells Helena to stop crying about her dad. She says, no more of this, Helena, go to no more, lest it uh, be rather thought you affect a sorrow than to have. Helena says, I do affect a sorrow indeed, but I have it too. Lafeu says, moderate lamentation is the right of the dead, excessive grief, the enemy to the living. Compare this to Hamlet's conversation with his mother, um, which is one of the first conversations that he has. Uh, she says, good Hamlet, cast thy nighted color off and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowst tis common, all that lives must die passing through nature to eternity. I, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so uh, particular with thee? Seems, madam, nay, I know not, seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected havior of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are all actions that a man might play. But I have that which in within but I have that within which passes show these but the trappings and the suits of woe. Of course, Hamlet needs about a dozen lines to say what any other character could do in one. But I think it's very interesting that we see this thought come up twice. Um, this thought of how is it possible to genuinely express your grief when the only way to express your grief it is by doing things that people who are not actually feeling grief could also do. The issue of what is the difference between existence or essence and mere performance of that essence is something that we will talk about at length whenever we get to Hamlet. But for now, I think it's interesting to draw the distinction um, that Helena actually is kind of playing a part. She is not um, affecting a sorrow. She doesn't have, she, she's not um, just pretending to be sad. She really is sad, but she is allowing everyone to be misled about why she actually is sad. Um, perhaps uh, this is because Helena is a woman and therefore deceitful, as you can read about at length in the sonnets, um, whereas Hamlet uh, is a man and therefore not deceitful. Uh, obviously this is how gender works. Um, but Helena uh, is not actually sad about her father's death, which everyone thinks she's sad about. She's sad that Bertram is going away. Um, interestingly, she does kind of talk about Bertram as though he is dead. Um, in her soliloquy later in the scene around line 109, um, she says, uh, but now he's gone and my idolatrous fancy must sanctify his relics. Relics are the things that saints have um, in order to be a saint, you have to be dead. I think, do I have any Catholics or Catholic scholars around here? You do have to be dead in order to be a saint, right? And you have to perform miracles from beyond the grave. Yeah, she's talking about him like he's dead. And so in this way, she is sort of substituting him um, as the creator of her tears um, for her father, who she admits should be the creator or the cause of her tears. Uh, and after she delivers that soliloquy, we get Paroles. What an interesting character. Some people think he's a sort of knockoff version of Falstaff. Um, he is not... I don't know. I'm not sure that I like Paroles more than Falstaff. I I've said before that I don't like Falstaff that much. Uh, this mainly just because I don't think he's funny. And if we cut out like 50% of the parts that are just him making jokes and left in like the sort of emotional core of his relationship with Prince Hal, um, I think I would like Falstaff better. Um, it doesn't help that he's dragged out through two plays, whereas Paroles only has this one play to be in, uh, and he is a subplot in it rather than the main plot. 
Uh, I should be remiss if I did not tell you that paroles means words, um, parole in uh, French, um, and uh, paroles is of course a man of words rather than of deeds. Um, and so he and Helena have this like a fantastically funny scene about virginity. He basically, out of nowhere, says, are you meditating on virginity? And she says, I, you have some stain of soldier in you. Let me ask you a question. Man is enemy to virginity. How may we barricado it against him? Keep him out. But he assails, and our virginity, though valiant in the defense, yet is weak. Unfold to us some warlike resistance. Now, this um, early feisty, sexy, um, you know, witty conversation that we have um, is something we've seen before in plays such as Much Ado About Nothing and The Taming of the Shrew, when it is had between two people who end up happily married. And so I do not think you would be wrong if you assume that that is where Helena and Paroles are heading towards. In fact, I think, ooh, my light just came on. There we go. In fact, uh, I think if um, we only had the first uh, act of this play and we had lost the rest of it, we would be reasonable to assume that the plot was going to be about Helena uh, learning to um, get over this rich snob that she's been in love with and appreciate the um, clever charms of someone, oh gosh, of someone who is um, actually a member of her social class um, because Helena is, I believe, Shakespeare's lowest ranking heroine and in fact lowest ranking main character. Um, Shakespeare typically writes about um, kings and queens, princes and pr princes and princesses, um, or you know Othello is a high ranking military general um, and he's married to an heiress. We get lots of heiresses, lots of people with either lots of money or um, lots of titles. And he has lower class characters, but they are pretty much relegated to side plots and comic roles. So uh, later in uh, his conversation with Helena, Paroles um, reinforces this notion of the interchangeability of family members. He says around line uh, 140, um, it is not politic in the commonwealth of nature to preserve virginity. Loss of virginity is rational increase. And there was never virgin got till virginity was first lost. That you were made of is metal to make virgins. Virginity, by being once lost, may be ten times found. By being ever kept, it is ever lost. Tis too cold a companion, away with it. Basically saying this role of virgin, which becomes unfulfilled when um, a mother uh, has sex and then becomes pregnant, um, is then able to be refulfilled by her children. Um, who are virgins that she creates. And so we will never run out of virgins as long as people keep having sex. And there's a part in his next speech that I just underlined and wrote lol next to because I think it's hilarious. Uh, he says, besides, virginity is peevish, proud, idle, made of self-love, which is the most inhibited sin in the canon. Pun on self-love, meaning like loving yourself more than other people and thinking that your virginity is more important than the, the good of the nation by creating more people or more virgins. Uh, but, but also in the sense of masturbation, uh, when he says it is the most inhibited sin in the canon, uh, he's of course referencing the story of Onan. Okay, the next sticky note I have is at the end of this scene, um, we close with another soliloquy from Helen starting, our remedies often ourselves do lie. Interestingly, she's starting with um, this claiming of potency, um, this claiming that she is able to, um, you know, do what, what she needs to do in order to affect her own ends. Uh, and then she says, what power is it which mounts my love so high that makes me see and cannot feed mine eye? She's asking, what, what person is it that makes me love Bertram so much? Um, and the answer to that question is William Shakespeare. So um, although on the one hand, Helena is 
claiming all of this agency for herself, she's also reminding us that um, she is in fact a creation of Shakespeare and that her desires and her actions are actually predetermined by him. A little meta moment for you all. And uh, I guess now is as good a time of any to bring up uh, the meter in this play, um, because this speech is entirely in couplets, so we have paired um, lines that rhyme of iambic pentameter. Our remedies often ourselves do lie, which we ascribe to heaven. The fated sky gives us free scope, only doth backward pull our slow designs when we ourselves are dull. What power is it which mounts my love so high that makes me see and cannot feed mine eye? The mightiest space in fortune nature brings to join likes, likes, and kiss like native things. Impossible be strange attempts to those that weigh their pains in sense, and do suppose what hath been cannot be. Whoever strove to show her merit that did not miss her love, strove and love rhyme in original pronunciation, the king's disease. My project may deceive me, but my intents are fixed and will not leave me. This is a highly poetic passage. The couplets are telling us that this is very lofty, unusually lofty for um, a doctor's daughter to be delivering this entire speech in couplets. Uh, now I haven't done a, a statistical analysis of this, but my, my gut feeling is that although All's Well That Ends Well has about um, the sort of ratio we would expect from a comedy between um, uh, verse and prose, the verse that we have is much more likely to be couplets than blank verse. So we have a lot more rhymed verse than unrhymed verse than in the typical Shakespeare play. And this creates this sort of um, memorable and also um, to a certain extent predictable, um, I don't know, flavor to the language. Even if I didn't say the final words, you could probably fill them in yourself if I just said, the king's disease, my project may deceive me, but my intents are fixed and will not. You could probably guess that those words are supposed to be leave me. And this is a hallmark of the folktale, which is a genre that this play is leaning on more heavily than the typical Shakespeare play does. More on that anon. Uh, for now, let us go to Paris. Act one, scene two, Bertram has come to the court. When the king sees him, he says, Youth, thy bearest thy father's face. Frank nature, rather curious than in haste, hath well composed thee. Thy father's moral parts mayest thou inherit to welcome to Paris. And then he says, I would I had that corporal soundness now, as when thy father and myself in friendship first tried our soldiership. Um, so first I noticed that Bertram is being um, compared to his father. He He's sort of um, being presented as filling the role of his father, which is back to that theme that is going to keep appearing. Um, and also, I like the little pun on the word corporal, um, which is both meaning relating to the body. The king is saying, I am no longer in good health, um, and uh, is the name of a, a rank in the military, and he is going to, he's about to talk about his time in the military. Then on to Act 1, Scene 3, where we see the Countess hanging out um, alone at home, um, and she's having a conversation with her clown La Vache, which means the cow in French. Um, La Vache is explaining that he uh, wants to get married so that he can have sex and he doesn't want to commit the sin of adultery. And so the Countess says, thy marriage sooner than thy wickedness, as in I would rather that you be married than that you commit adultery. And he says, I am out of friends, madam, and I hope to have friends for my wife's sake. The Countess says, such friends are thine enemies, knave, uh, meaning that if you have friends for your wife's sake, uh, meaning that they are friends with you because of your wife, that means those friends are sleeping with your wife, which would actually make them your enemy. So if they are um, assuming your role um, in like a familial relationship to your wife, there's the people stepping into other people's familiar roles. Um, and that's bad news. And he says, aha, you're shallow, madam, in great friends, meaning you don't have a lot of good friends in that case. For the knaves come to do that for me, which I am a weary of. He that ears my land spares my team and gives me leave to in the crop. If I be his cuckold, he's my drudge. Basically saying, I am totally fine with other people having sex with my wife. By analogy, if someone else wanted to come plow my field and still let me have all of the corn that's produced, joke's on him. 
which, uh, while it may not exactly make sense, is certainly entertaining. <laughs> Okay, the next note that I have is here in Act 2, Scene 3, um, and it is reinforcing the, the idea that this is um, a folktale, or a folktale-influenced play. Um, and very interestingly, the fact that it is folktale-influenced is directly addressed in the text, um, which is different than you'll get in the, the true romances, or the late romances, which just sort of embrace, fully embrace their fairy taleness um, without any irony. So Lefeu says, they say miracles, oh, this is right after Helena has cured the king of his disease. Uh, Lefeu says, they say miracles are past and we have our philosophical persons to make modern and familiar things supernatural and causeless. Oh gosh, it just got dark. I think it's going to rain and that's why the... Mm. Lefeu says, they say miracles are past and we have our philosophical persons to make modern and familiar things supernatural and causeless. Hence it is that we make trifles of terrors ensconcing ourselves into seeming knowledge when we should submit ourselves to an unknown fear. And Parola says, why, it is the rarest argument of wonder that hath shot out in our latter times. They're both saying, this is of some miraculous thing, not the sort of... Ooh. Not the sort of thing that would make you throw pencils on the ground. Um, not the sort of thing that you would expect in like these modern days when you know that like fairy tales aren't real, but this fairy tale thing is just happening. Are we, are we in a play or something? Okay guys, I'm gonna put a white scarf on over my navy dress because I think the camera keeps thinking that it's too dark and turning this light on. So I'm gonna convince it that, that this is the right lighting scenario. Later in the scene, we will also have this sort of stock fairy tale scenario. Um, the king has said that Helena can have her choice of the French lords, um, and uh, so of course she goes to each of them in turn, um, and of course we already know, and Helena already knows, that she is not going to pick any of them. We have some dramatic irony going on. But we need to have these four different lords accepting Helena and she is rejecting them um, in order to provide contrast for uh, when she uh, is trying to accept Bertram and he is rejecting her. So then of course Bertram rejects her and the king gets these two um, very interesting um, speeches. The first one is, "'Tis only title thou disdainst in her, the which I can build up. Strange it is that our bloods of color, weight, and heat poured altogether would quite confound distinction, yet stands off in differences so mighty. If she be all that is virtuous, save what thou dislikest, a poor physician's daughter, thou dislikest of virtue for the name." But do not so. From lowest place, when virtuous things proceed, the place is dignified by the doer's deed. Where great additions swells, additions being um, titles sort of tacked on to the end of your, your name, uh, and virtue none, it is a drop seed honor. Good alone is good without a name. Vileness is so. The property by which it is should go, not by the title. I'm getting chills reading this. It's very interesting in the early modern period to be getting this um, unambiguous argument for meritocracy rather than aristocracy, um, especially because Shakespeare is living in an aristocracy. And you could almost read this as a response that Shakespeare is delivering to um, his future doubters. Um, now, I have not brought up uh, the issue of whether or not Shakespeare actually wrote Shakespeare's plays in the videos, although someone did talk to me about it in the comments um, of one of the earlier Bard Book Club videos. And the fact that I have not brought it up uh, should tell you that I do believe that William Shakespeare wrote at least most of the work that is attributed to Shakespeare, um, and you know possibly some work that is currently not attributed to Shakespeare. People who uh, don't believe that tend to be a little bit louder about it. And certainly one of the arguments for Shakespeare not writing Shakespeare's plays um, is that he was too poor and thus could not have known all of these like intelligent references that uh, are demonstrated in the works. And he here is saying like it doesn't matter what what rank you're born into man. Some people are just good. If you now want to have a long argument in the comments with me about who wrote Shakespeare's plays, please know that I am not interested. 
Okay, then the next thing that I had to note, um, it's Act 2, Scene 3, around line uh, 166, sorry, 266, um, is a conversation between Lafeu and Paroles, and Lafeu is one of the first people to realize that Paroles um, is all uh, bark and no bite, he's all words and no deeds, and he has this fantastic line um, when he's talking about how Paroles is sort of gartering his sleeves, he's like tying ribbons around his sleeves, um, which is the similar thing to what people do with their stockings on their legs, they would tie garters to hold up their stockings, um, obviously there's no need to tie ribbons around your sleeves, your sleeves are not going to fall off. But he says, you know, since you're treating your um, arms like legs, thou wert best set thy lower part where thy nose stands. Basically, you might as well put your penis where your nose is, which I think is hilarious. And then another example of the ways in which this play is more folkloric, um, at the beginning of Act 3, Scene 1, um, the Duke of Florence comes on and he says, so, from point to point, now have you heard the fundamental reasons of this war, whose great decision hath much blood let forth and more thirsts after. So he says, I have just explained to you, various lords of France who have come to fight in my war, what, what this war is about, what we're fighting for, who we're fighting against. Of course, we, the audience, do not get to hear about this. And it's this rather um, folkloric thing to just have, like, a generic war going on. They're just going to fight. How? Why? Against whom? Whatever. This is very different than the histories where we get a long explanation of exactly what people are fighting about. And then uh, moving on to Act 3, Scene 2, when Helena comes home to greet her new mother-in-law um, and she explains how Bertram has abandoned her to go to war and has not had sex with her, we get um, one, one of the two uh, real exchanges of family members that occur in, in deed as opposed to just in words in this play, and that is when the Countess um, rejects Bertram as her son and says Helena is now her only child. Thou robst me of a moiety, he was my son, but I do wash his name out of my blood, and thou art all my child. Uh, which reminds me of a, a, another thing that I, I should have brought up, um, which is that we never get an explanation for why Helena is in love with Bertram. I mean, she tells us that he's good looking, but that's pretty much it. We don't know why she is in love with him, and I think she's just in love because she's in love. Because this is not a story about real people, this is a fairy tale. And that's why she continues to love him, even when he is like a massive jerk to her, because this is not a play of complex characters. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Like, Little Red Riding Hood does not have complex characters, but it is still incredibly enduring. Okay, and then the thing that I noted in Act 3, Scene 4, um, which is when the Countess receives the, or finds the letter that Helen had written to her. Um, Helen's letter starting, I am St. Jaques, pilgrim, thither gone, ambitious love hath so in me offended that barefoot, blah, 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 blah. Um, this letter is a perfect sonnet. Um, so again, Shakespeare showing us the um, intelligence and... Um, in, in some ways, like, nobleness of this doctor's daughter, um, demonstrating to us why she is worthy to be married to a lord, even if he is a douchebag. Uh, now moving on to Act 4, Scene 2. Um, this is a conversation between Bertram and Diana, um, when Diana has been instructed by Helena to accept Bertram's advances and say, okay, I will have sex with you, but we have to do it in my room, in the dark, and you can't stay that long, because it's not actually me. Here, Bertram invokes some of the ideas that Paroles was bringing up in um, his first conversation with Helena back in the first scene of the play. I mean, he says to Diana, now you should be as your mother was when your sweet self was got. Reinforcing the notion that um, virgins lose their virginity in order to create more virgins. And this scene is another, like, clever, flirtatious scene between two people who do not end up together. And now I want to discuss this this very interesting moment which occurs in Act 4, Scene 3, um, which is a scene where Paroles is 
captured, blindfolded, and made to reveal to Bertram um, that he would totally betray um, his army and his friends uh, if his life were on the line. So he starts out by divulging information about the army and sort of how many troops they have, um, and then he sort of needlessly insults some of the captains of the French army um, unwittingly to their faces. And then the interpreter finds a letter in Paroles's pocket, um, which is written to Diana, telling her that um, Bertram is not to be trusted and that if she's going to have sex with him, she should demand her payment up front because Bertram will totally cut and run. And Bertram, of course, uh, this is perhaps the final straw for him. And the purpose of this scene is to teach Bertram that his um, initial perceptions of people are wrong, um, which he will then sort of transfer over to Helena in the final scene when he realizes that he is in fact in love with her. But even though Bertram finds this a an incredibly uh, repulsive act, I think we as the audience think that this is a good thing that Paroles is warning Diana, um, which makes Paroles a very fascinating character and possibly the most complex character in this play, um, and I also think more complex than Falstaff. Falstaff never learns. He says insulting things of Prince Hal um, when he doesn't realize that Prince Hal is listening. He repeatedly lies to his face, but then at the end, when um, Prince Hal becomes King Henry, he runs up to him in sort of the middle of his coronation procession or recession um, and, and sort of demands um, special attention. And Prince Hal, now King Henry, is like, um, no. What are you doing here? I know thee not, old man. But Paroles, on the other hand, at least um, demonstrates this this concern for other people outside of himself, even um, to the detriment of the the man that he's sort of leeching off of. But Paroles actually seems to learn from his um, experience of being exposed. He says, whoever knows himself a braggart, let him fear this, for it will come to pass that every braggart shall be found an ass. Rust, sword, cool blushes, and Paroles live safest in shame. Being fooled by foolery thrive. There's place and means for every man alive. I'll after them. Which means that um, at the end, Paroles maybe gets a bit of a happy ending. Remember that Lafeu was the first person to call out Paroles for not living up to these fantastical things that he's saying about himself. Uh, and at the end, when Lafeu encounters Paroles, he says, um, Sira, inquire further after me. I had talk of you last night. Though you are a fool and a knave, you shall eat. Go follow. He basically invites him to have dinner. And then in the final scene of this play, uh, we have a repetition of someone talking themselves into a trap and then finally being exposed as a liar. Um, but now it's not happening with Paroles, it's happening to Bertram. He's producing all the wrong rings and then Diana shows up and claims that he promised to marry her and Bertram is still convinced that he can talk his way out of this until BAM! Helena shows up. And she has completed the two commissions that he demanded of her, she has taken the ring from off his finger, and she is now pregnant with his child. Um, this is another um, sort of element of the folkloricness um, of this play. We are depending on Bertram not realizing which woman he was having sex with, um, and we are also depending on the fact that even though they have only had sex once, uh, hole in one, she got pregnant, because otherwise the story wouldn't work. And then Bertram has this immediate turnaround. Um, as soon as he sees her, um, she says, uh, "'Tis but the shadow of a wife you see the name and not the thing." Bertram says, "'Both, both, oh pardon,' saying she is both uh, his wife in name and his wife in deed. Um, and then his last line of the play is, um, if she, my liege, can make me know this clearly, I'll love her dearly, ever, ever dearly. Now this is such a ridiculous thing to happen. Bertram has spent the entire play, including uh, much of this scene, trying to avoid marrying Helen and other uh, another low-class sort of woman. So some productions will lean on the if of his final line, 
if she, my liege, can make me know this clearly, I love her dearly, ever, ever dearly, meaning I don't think she could actually explain how this has happened. I don't believe that's my child. I'm not, I'm not convinced that she actually has gotten my ring, sort of thing. But I think Shakespeare wants us to genuinely believe this. And if you have been on board with the fairy tale-ness of the rest of the play, hopefully you will be on board with this sort of fairy tale ending. Which, of course, we knew was coming because the play is called All's Well That Ends Well. So it has to end well. And now, I don't know if you can tell, but I am losing my voice. Which means it is time to edit this video. Let's see how long it is. Thanks for watching, guys, and remember that next month we will be reading A Midsummer Night's Dream, which I expect many of you have already read, but um, there is no harm in reading it a second or a third or a fourth or a fifth time.